Hi, my name is Isabella Johnston, the Intern Whisperer, and it's brought to you by Employers for Change and streams from your favorite podcast channels or on our YouTube channel with closed captions. As we move closer to 2030, we are looking at adaptive learning. Yes, this is our tip of the week. We are talking about what adaptive learning is and how that can help your company culture. This learning method is considered one of the best approaches for constructive learning outcomes even in the case of adult learners. It offers learning by focusing on the strengths of each learner and keeps them constantly engaged. Who doesn't love that? And it can improve learning outcomes and reduce the rate of dropouts from courses. We all see how quickly technological advances are happening and adaptive learning has to evolve quickly to keep pace. As a matter of fact, in 2022, the adaptive learning market size was valued at $2.78 billion in 2022, as I mentioned, but the 2030 forecast expects it to reach $11 billion. That is basically seven years growth, and we're seeing quite a bit of change there. So keep tuned in. Welcome to the Intern Whisper. Our show is all about the future of work and innovation. Hi, so welcome to the Interim Whisper. Our show is all about the future of work and innovation. And today's guest is Patty Brownsword. She is the partner of Grounded with Data, a partner, not the partner. Well, maybe, I don't know. It depends on how she views it. Yeah. Grounded with Data, a data analytics consulting firm that helps mid to large businesses make better decisions through data. She is also working on a new program to help nonprofits collect and use data from their stakeholders to inform their paths forward. She is also the chair of UCF Data Analytics Advisory Board, which is how I met her at an event that was Black Orlando Tech, and she was talking about it, and I went, what? I want to know more. Exactly. Yeah. So welcome to the show, Patty. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I find it so interesting also that you're a woman in data, and that's unusual, I think. We're getting better. There's more of us. It's happening slowly. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you don't always see see that as like women in, in development, women in data and the numbers. You know, I don't know if you have numbers, but maybe you'll share that later in the show. <laughs> Typically, I kick off our show um, where I ask the guests to tell us five words that describe you and why those five words. All right. So my <laughs> first word that I always jump to is loyal. It's people, I'm... I'm fiercely loyal for my friends, for my family, um, for people who I know need to have to have help and they need it. And I'm, I'm, I'm loyal. Um, it's funny. The one time at a leadership thing, they're like, if what kind of bird would you be? And I was like a penguin and like, why? Cause they're loyal. And so it's just kind of always stuck with me to be, I'm, I'm loyal. I'm, I'm a penguin and they're also daring and driven, but those aren't my two other words or part of my five. But, you know, I, I don't know. They could be. I can sneak them in there. You just did. I know. All right. Because <laughs> I'm I'm smart and I'm funny too. <laughs> uh, I think you're funny. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm funny as well. But um, no, and then the, the smart, funny, put those together. You do get a kind of interesting quirkiness. So I'm quirky. Um, mm -hmm. I can go full blown nerd on Marvel or Star Trek. And then I can also be chill and peaceful and I study meditation and so mm -hmm. a whole swing of lots of fun things um and then I'm passionate I, I'm passionate about the work I do I'm passionate about the people that I help um I just feel like it's important to put yourself behind things and with doing that there needs to be a sense of passion if 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 you have no passion for what you're doing people can tell it falls flat and they're not interested that is very true. I would say that. So have you ever done stand-up comedy? I have not yet. I've been told by friends that I should um, try out for, there's this women comedy thing that happens annually, but I have done improv. Um, I was a big proponent of always starting improv games in the Girl Scouts when we were camping. And then I took an improv class after I graduated high school. 
here in Orlando? No, actually, it was in my hometown. They actually had it at the local library. So there was a little handful of us and we learned all the different improv games. And I still love Whose Line Is It Anyway? That TV show just cracks me up. I just love those guys. Well, you mentioned the library, the city of Orlando, their library has open mic night. Oh, really? And they also do um, karaoke, <laughs> but they also have open mic and they have improv. And so any of those things that you're interested in, it's once a week, there's a different theme and it's a live stage. The, all of the backdrop is behind it. The equipment is all real. Oh, <laughs> it's going to feel like you're really there. I think they can hold like, it's in the Mel, Mel Rose Center. Oh, sure. Yeah. So be sure to go check it out. They do it on, I believe it's Saturdays. Okay. And so the library is open on Saturday and Sunday till 530. So it's in the day. Nice. And then you could go out to dinner and celebrate. Yeah. yeah. You just did something. I've got some fun stories and um, a podcast that my husband and I did for a while called Patty is Still Learning we would always have like some story time where every other time he would tell one of his favorite stories about his life and I would tell a story of mine. And so I've got, I've got good material. <laughs> That's so funny. That would be good. If you decide to do that, I'll, I'll find something and I'll send it to you about the library having that. Um, the city of Orlando library, shameless plug for them. They are a five-star library in the country. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they are known for being very innovative and having really cool things to do. They have a makerspace in there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They have all kinds of podcasting rooms and they, they teach simulation. Huh. Yeah. All kinds of stuff is going on in the library there. I think that's interesting. <laughs> All right. So um, I like the part about quirky. What's the quirkiest thing that you've ever done? Can you think of something? I'm mm, putting you on the spot that on is, that one. Yeah, that is on the spot. All right. So I would say doing the Girl Scout thing. Well, yeah, pretty... no, the Girl Scout improv. <laughs> but so I once attended this um, leadership conference and I, I was not, I'm, I'm, I'm about 95% um, extroverted if you yeah. can tell yeah yeah um, I so i have no like I, I get energy from people but i i also when in my youth i was i was shy but it just there if i was in certain situations i just wouldn't put myself out there but in mm -hmm. this one leadership um training i went to i was pretty quiet the whole time um i i was making friends and and things but the counselors just didn't see me um, being very gregarious, I would say. And when we had this, um, this event that everyone, every team group was supposed to do a performance and we had, um, decided that our team was going to show off like our stupid human tricks, but I don't really have a stupid human trick, but I decided I would be the MC and, um, give me a microphone and here I go. And so I was just, loud and bold and funny and like making interesting comments on different things, but also, you know, it, making like lots of laughs and stuff. And, and, and everybody afterwards was like, we didn't, we didn't know you had that in you. We didn't, <laughs> that was the, that was, that was crazy. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, that's, that's me, man. I just, you know, there was no need. There was no call for that in a, in a group setting. <laughs> that's because they think of Patty as being data analytics patty mm -hmm. and that's it's nerdy yeah 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 you don't see humor crossing over into there no but you can be you can be all the things yeah um, and i think that's actually what leads to the idea of being quirky yeah i would agree with you yeah yeah i think it's really brave to be a, a kid in girl scouts i don't know if you were actually in the girl scouts or brownie or wherever I I was all the K through, okay, the daisies through, um, I think I went to juniors. There's actually in I4 Biz Magazine, July 2021, 22, I don't remember. Um, there's an article on me on how I'm an entrepreneur and I was a Girl Scout. Nice. Yeah. Um, they, the Girl Scouts wanted to like sponsor an article. And so they reached out to um, the Athena leadership group and they threw out on the Facebook group and said, Hey, has anybody been a Girl Scout? And I was like, that was me. I was a yeah. Girl Scout. And um, yeah, so did all that. I was camp counselor for a bit. I know way too many Girl Scout sing along songs that I can't wait till all the little kids in my village get old enough to want to hear them. 
Um, right now they're still not interested, but I've got a lot of good songs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was a Girl Scout too. Yeah. I don't think as long as you though. No. Yeah. Mm. But I have good memories of it. Yeah. 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 We were one of those high adventure ones. Ooh, high adventure. Yeah. They call them high adventure where you could either go to sea base, you know, and you go and you do diving and stuff like that. Well, we didn't do that. No. Um, but there was different, different themes. You could either go to NASA, you could go to oh. do stuff that was, you know, rock climbing. I did the rock climbing thing. Nice. Yeah. So I did skiing. Um, and there was a fun story of the horrors of coming back with like this bus breaking down in the middle of nowhere and staying at this like very strange motel with red leather furniture black and white tiled floors and animal heads everywhere and we're oh. like we're like 12 and we're like what is happening <laughs> heat barely worked and it was cold it was great. oh it, it's a memory yeah it is <laughs> yeah it is it's like did they did they record the shining here exactly. i don't know yeah, right. no, it was a sketch but um yeah we got we, we were in a mcdonald's for like 10 hours waiting for like something to happen so a lot of patience a lot of waiting around but um yeah so girl scouts was a good time for me um but i did a lot of other things besides girl scouts too i was in the dance and i was in um piano and then i all sorts of i got into a lot of stuff i mm. just really my parents let me do a little bit of everything mm -hmm. which is really nice because then it kind of helped open yeah. up my world a lot. So. Isn't that true? I was just thinking of that this morning, honestly, about how so many schools don't have like music and art and those various programs that are there to help anybody mm -hmm. <laughs> figure out who am I and what do I like? Yeah. Yeah. We actually, um, we found a study recently that was conducted by uni a university uh, museum and they're having a very hard time right now um, getting kids, students to come to the museum mm -hmm. um, because they are constrained to the old structure of what museums do and mm -hmm. not what the young people want. And so this was whole this whole study done on um, the fact that kids haven't had that exposure to art in their high school lives. And so they have no appreciation or understanding of what they're even supposed to do when they're there um, and to go to a museum like that. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. What city is that? Oh goodness, it's a white paper I could send you a copy of so you can put the link. Was in the it show like notes. a little town or no, it was a major university with a wow. big with a big with a big um the big museum there. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's crazy. All right. So where did you get started as you're an entrepreneur for sure? Mm -hmm. Um, how did you get started with that? Usually we go back to what was your major? Or some people go back to, well, when I was six, I was delivering newspapers. I don't care where you want to go, you can start wherever you want. Um sure. how did you get started to where you are now? Well, um I started with um advertising. And I, I did a lot of internships over at UCF. I think that was one of the main reasons why I came to UCF is I knew that there would be those opportunities uh, mm -hmm. to be in the advertising program meant you were in the ad PR program at UCF. And so I was hedging my bet. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so I interned a lot. Um, I did a PR, a marketing, um, and then I wanted to do an advertising and I wanted to have an account executive internship because that was the next thing. And luckily, this wonderful woman, um, Melanie Diabru at Kramer Crassel, when she interviewed me, she said, no, you belong in media. And I said, I don't even know what that is, but I need the account executive. That is the next thing. And she's like, that's why you need to be in media because of the way you organize your mind. Um, and I fell in love with media planning, did that for a decade almost. Um, at the same time, got my master's. Um, and then when with media planning, I, I think that the biggest advantage was that it was at the time when online advertising was coming into play. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the clients could say, you can measure how it worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, we can see clicks. Later on, we knew that clicks were just a waste of time. But back then it was, you know, impressions and clicks and then you could get conversions and it was amazing. But then it's also a bunch of numbers. And you're working with clients that have never had to deal with those numbers before. So mm -hmm. how do you explain performance? Mm -hmm. How do you show that something was good or bad or better than it was before, or worse, or what the lessons learned if you had not as great performance? What do you do? And so that 
whole area was almost that the whole time was a proving ground of me building out reports from scratch because that didn't exist anywhere. There was no Tableau, there was no Power BI. It was Excel and me and figuring out that most of the clients didn't know how to open up an Excel file to look at that kind of stuff. So you had to migrate it over to Word. And how did you make it pretty? And how did you make it look right to tell the right story? Um, and so that whole, you know, during the, the aughts years um, was really just trying to figure out the best way to show how things perform, why they perform the way they have, and then understanding that the different audiences care about different things. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like my foundation. And then I got my master's that helped a lot, just being able to think that way and think about all the things. Um, so my MBA, but then um, I went to Clear Channel Outdoor. Yeah. Um, and Are I, they still around? Oh gosh, yes. Okay. So big, so big, but I managed the digital billboards in town. And so I got to play with a lot of nonprofits who they said, Hey, could you put us on our, your digital billboard for free for our event? I was like, well, will you give me t tickets or a table to the event? So I can dress fancy and have a good time. And they're like, yeah. So I got to meet a lot of nonprofits, um, but then also at the same time work with small and medium-sized businesses where it was no longer just a budget for advertising that they had. It was their money and they could either use it to you mm -hmm. know, pay for their kids something or other, or use it for advertising to grow their business. And then it became like understanding the real value of a dollar Mm -hmm. and what that means for business owners. Mm -hmm. And so that was my nonprofit and kind of business stint. Lily padded to being a, um, back to being a media director. But at that time I wound up doing for three quarters of a year when I was a media director, I did this major mega pivot table, Excel madness. It would take me 55 hours to work for this one client that had seven divisions. And I'd had to build quarterly performance of my advertising campaigns and how the impressions and the clicks and the post, um, the post impression actions beyond the clicks and the conversions and the hire, because it was talent acquisition and all that stuff. And it took me 55 hours of pivot tables. And then I had to present it all and it was exhausting, mm -hmm. but I did it three times. And, um, and then I had a really good friend who was a data scientist at AAA and she caught wind of what I was doing and we were having tea and hanging out and stuff all the time, but she got appro approval to hire a assistant for her <laughs> um, in the business intelligence department. And um, she offered me the job. Hmm. And so that was my first foray into getting into business intelligence, but the um, fourth quarter, no one else where I was working could do what I was doing. I tried to train somebody, but he was so busy doing all the other regular media planner stuff. There's just, there was no way anybody could do it. So they had to come to me and say, Hey, we can't tell our client that um, we can't give this to them because you're not here anymore. So would you do it? And I was like, well, I work full time now somewhere else. And so I'd have to do this on the weekends. But if you let me um, use my friend who's a data scientist and we can use this new software that we use Tableau, we'll make it better and we'll do it faster. And so we'll do it cheaper than what you would have paid the other place. If you continue to maybe throw us some stuff. And that's how we started our company. So it became, wow. yeah, it became a side hustle and AAA allowed moonlighting. And, um, the requirement for moonlighting was you told your boss that you had a moonlight and it didn't conflict. So I looked at my data scientist boss and I said, we, we have a business now. She goes, oh, okay. And then she went to her boss. Um, and the justification was there wasn't a whole lot of data science happening at AAA. And if we could do some machine learning stuff, we could play with Azure. We could play with, um, the, you know, spinning up, uh, Amazon web services stuff and, and really do that on our own in other ways, then it would only just benefit AAA. Mm -hmm. And so they let us do it. And um, eventually it got to the CEO, what, what what I was doing, but he was like, cool, I guess, you know, sure. Um, so I moved from BI to strategy and that's when he became in my upline, the CEO. And so when I applied for the strategy position, I literally put the company name on my resume. And so when my boss who hired me for the position, she knew full well, this was going to be a thing. And, and she even said like, oh, you know, this job is what you're going to be doing for me. I was the chief of staff for her company or for her company, but for her department. Um, 
And she said, this is only like a two-year position anyway. You get it going, you do well, you move on. She's like, it'll be fine. And it was. Um, I would have only done it for two years, but then the pandemic happened. And I didn't feel like I wanted to hang my shingle full time yet. So I only went full time July of 2021. Mm. And it's been amazing. But that's my whole story. But all the things that led up to it all the way to here has gotten me here doing what I do. And it's freaking cool. It is cool. <laughs> and you mentioned that one, one of your supervisors was a woman. How many women were actually in these courses that when you were studying data analytics? Well, I wasn't studying data analytics. That wasn't a thing in college. So... <laughs> interesting yeah no it was um funny enough at AAA, there the department was about 80 percent female in the wow. business intelligence department um i mean the even the leader was a woman which was was very different you'd go to a tableau user group and you'd be like well i'm the only we're the only girls here from triple a you know um and there were a handful of others but it was mainly boys um and uh, yeah, it was, it was, so I was in a unique, you know, environment in that way, but I've gone to some conferences and some other things and seen, you know, the disparity, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's growing, it's getting better. So why don't you explain for our listeners what a Tableau is? What is that? <laughs> so it's software package programs. It's for data visualization. There's a lot of different things you can start with. Um, and anybody can data visualize with a pen and a paper and just showing how a graph works. But Tableau makes it so much easier. It's kind of like an Etch-a-Sketch, right? Sure. Um, it's really a really expensive one. Really expensive. Not, not, not really expensive, but yeah, it can get there um, depending on if you're a major company or an individual. Mm -hmm. But uh, Tableau Public that's always a fun place and space to play in um, because you can use free for Tableau as long mm -hmm. as you publish it to the community and then everybody can access it and stuff. So it's pretty cool. You can also hide and sneak stuff and not not publish everything, but um, I've gotten some good data sets from, from the Tableau user community, which is cool. Very so it's nice. a whole big world of, of Tableau, but it's one of the top, but then Microsoft made Power BI. Um, Google made, I think it's called Looker now. It used to be Data Studio. Um, so there's a lot of different visualization platforms you can use or good old Excel. So Google Analytics has changed. That's coming out. That uh, starts. It's June, already switched. June. Well, they've made it, but they're not going to um, do anything with Google Analytics 3 after June 30th. Mm -hmm. So my business partner and I, Jack, were taking the classes because we used to do a lot of Google Analytics 3, like reporting when we did mm -hmm. marketing audits, um, because we would showcase, you know, where people came from, what did they do, how did they convert, where did it come from, all that kind of stuff. And now GA4, um, it's just being done a little differently. The nomenclature is different. How you pull information out is different. But the cool stuff is like how you can combine data with your website and your apps and all the good stuff. So it's, it's going to get us more advanced, but yeah, people who have been, um, what's the word dragging their feet, uh, yeah. will have to make that change soon. Um, for me with like groundedwithdata.com, um, because of the fact that it's been around for a while, um, GA4, I mean, um, when I started the website for my own business, I just popped it in the GA4 immediately. There was no reason to go into Google analytics three, um, so a lot of people already have it done, but uh, it's fairly painless to migrate fairly, hmm. but we have learned that the numbers, the different, the numbers are different. It's able to scrub bots differently. It's able to scrub like a lot of different things differently. So you just got to kind of be careful about saying, oh, well, you know, now it's a, it's a one-to-one -one relationship of, you know, site visits, like nah, guidepost, you know, so it's good to run it. It was, it would have been good. What's the the um the proverb of you know it was it's the only time better to plant a tree than today was like 10 years ago kind of thing. Yeah. You know, so you know get to GA4 now or now oh I'm sorry it is over it is over yeah I've been googling it while you were talking it says mm -hmm. um you know like how can you still learn this they ha have google analytics it says free online courses but you know, you have to either go to Udemy or someplace mm -hmm. else. No, Google Analytics has got one. So that's the one we're using. Pretty basic. You just got to read it and stuff. But then they also have the um, certification. Yeah. So The certification is something I've had. Um, I started the first one. I honestly didn't have time to finish it, the first one. Yeah. It would have been a good one to finish. I guess maybe I still can. Yeah. But the um, 
students that work with me, you know, I say, okay, work on these certificates, get these, you know, cause they have street value. Yes. Yes, they do. Well, especially when you, it's, it's all about the currency of, do you have the experience or do you have the certification that helps you get some of the experience? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it becomes a sliding scale. So the other funny story is I went into business intelligence and I got the leg up from my friend who hired me, even though I had no business intelligence background, nor had I known Tableau yet. Um, mm-hmm. we, they were all training at the same time on Tableau. So I had, I had it easy. My husband though, he was a financial analyst and he looked over at what I was doing. I was like, what is that? what is that data analysis that you're doing? Mm -hmm. And so he thought, well, this would be a much more upwardly mobile thing to do in Orlando than financial analysts, because that's more of a New England thing. And um, so he got into it, but because he didn't have a friend who would offer him a job, he had to get that Tableau certification. So I'm not Tableau certified, but um, I didn't have to be. I know what to do and I know how to do it. And I have enough experience now that I don't, really care if I get certified it or not. I know how to do exactly what I need to do, but he had to get it because that was the only way recruiters would look at him. So. Well, what do you think the best courses are for somebody that's new coming into analytics would be? Because it says here mm-hmm. the, the Google analytics cert- certification is going away. Um, the, well, they'll have GA4. I see um, some of that on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they'll have GA4 analytics because that's going to be a whole different animal. Um, the insights generator, they're using um, some AI technology that'll make it a little bit easier to have like a citizen data analyst kind of thing mm-hmm. to be able to look at stuff, but to be able to pull things out and really tell the right story um, in the right way, it, it, it's helpful. But I think some some data analyst primers um, would even be going back into like Storytelling with Data by Cole Naflik Nesbaum. Um, she's really great at just teaching people how to visualize data, tool agnostic, <laughs> just taking a sheet of paper and doing it the right way. There's so many people that I still see use like red and green and um, and just using um, bar charts when it should be a line chart and then cutting off the bar charts mm-hmm. onto... We also, um, on one of our podcast episodes, we talk about the dangers of misleading charts and graphs Mm -hmm. uh, because people still don't get it. (laughs) No, that's true. That's true. Um, And so that's a great foundation. And then when it comes to software, if you can learn one, then it's really intuitive to pick up any of the others, really. You just got to know, like, if you know what a dimension and a measure is in one, then you know where to find and look for the other things and you know what something can do. Um, Tableau is really easy to learn though. And there are like free courses you can take um, through Udemy, um, Coursera, I think is where I took some of mine. Um, And I just didn't pay for the certification. I paid for the audit, but you can pay for the certifications. That's what my husband did. I think he did Udemy and then got, you know, took, Mm -hmm. paid for the class and then paid for the certification. So, but once you learn one, um, you, you can, you can pretty much pick up on any of them. Yeah, Tableau says that you can say hello to Tableau GPT and Tableau Pulse. Oh gosh, there's new things coming out. Yeah. Uh, Tableau GPT, yes. Mm-hmm. Everybody has GPT. Everybody right has GPT. Yeah, totally, totally there. So you chose a person to work with and is he here in Orlando as your business partner? No, Dr. Jack Slingluff, he is in Sarasota. Mm-hmm. He's in South Florida. I'm um, Actually, he worked with my friend who was a data scientist. So originally she and I had a company, um, but when, you know, you're a single mom and the pandemic happens and you're having to juggle a lot and you want to remain good friends with the person that you're working with, you say, I got to bow out. It's like, I get it. Yeah. So, um, so we dissolved that company, but. uh, Are you the one with kids? No. Okay. Not I. No, (laughs) no. She's the single mom, two kids. And she was like, I can't balance like I feel guilty when I'm work you know working the weekends for you know with us on the company and not with my girls but then if I'm with my girls and I know you're stressing out trying to work on Mm -hmm. the company and you know it was a side hustle for her but I was like we can grow this into a business I could go full time (laughs) and he was like that is not what I was planning on doing with this you know so yeah so um, Dr. Jack, though he and I started um, working together once he got his PhD 
he had stayed in connection with my um, with the data scientist and when um when he got the phd she was like come play with us be our contractor and so he was a contractor for a good long time and then when we decided to break apart the the company I wanted to keep going. I had contracts with clients. I wanted to see this through. I had growth. There's growth potential. Um, I told Jack, I was like, I can't do this on my own. I don't want to do this on my own. I'm much more collaborative rather mm-hmm. than wanting to own something. Like I just know I can't win clients, run projects, own the project, see it through, manage mm-hmm. contractors, just run a business. And I was like, it's not fun. I don't mm-hmm. want to do it just on my own. Mm-hmm. And so like he and I, even today, like working on a project, we spent four or five hours on Zoom together, just sitting there, you know, working mm-hmm. and then commenting and it's his project. So I'm like, well, how did you want this staged? And how do you want that? Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. But we have a blast together. Mm-hmm. We're totally, we're totally nerds together. And we just so great. And it's nice that, um, his wife likes me and my husband likes him and, uh, but we spend more time together than we do with them. So, <laughs> so it, it's helpful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Isn't it funny how the word nerd has become so popular and now it's a good thing. Oh, it's a great thing. I love it. Yes. Well, and to be a nerd is to be highly passionate about something. Yeah. You know, and something specific. Yeah. Um, I just happen to be a, a nerd about a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm getting the, the, the definite vibes on the funny for sure. <laughs> for sure. I'm, I'm loving this. So that's how you got started, but where did you go to school? You mentioned UCF. Yeah. Is that where you did all of your education? Yes. I did add PR minor in marketing, and then I got my master's at UCF. So that's, that's been no that's, other school, no other university. Um, I've done sort of like I've done python certification at the at some data conference and stuff like that and i'm always learning something new from somewhere but so um, is a data analyst also a programmer no (laughs) so you're studying python yeah it was python for visualization um it was to use it for supervised and unsupervised machine learning oh okay Um, so with the python it was writing the the code, but it was specifically to do like a cluster analysis and stuff like that. And I had no Python experience and AAA was like, Hey, we're paying you to take a Python course and, you know, classification modeling. And I was like, I, I don't know Python. So I quickly like tried to learn some calls and things and stuff. And then we went, I went there and I was kept raising my hand. I'm like, help, (laughs) help. But yeah, so, you know, I can read it. I can read SQL a little bit too. I know what it meant. It's what meant for, um, and, and what it, what it can and should do. Mm. But, um, I am more because of, I was in media planning and I was figuring out where the ad should go. I was always constantly inundated with new research, new data, new statistics, media kits, all the different stats and, you know, demographics and psychographics and all these things about things. And then the ad agency I worked with had a market research department that would, you know, hand us books of like the portrait of the American traveler, it was called. And the CEO, the CEO president of the ad agency said, like, if the first eight slides aren't slides about our data that justify or that give cause for why your media plan is the way it is, then you're not using our data, our, our own research. So I, I've always had research and numbers handed to me where I've made a story out of it. Mm -hmm. I like that much better than cleaning data. So in the business intelligence world and data and and data analysis world, 80% of the job is cleaning data because data is, is dirty. Data is always messy and it always has to be cleaned, which is what Jack and I spent five hours today doing and when i left for this podcast he was he was working on it some more so tomorrow we can actually do my idea which is finally ranking the information of the project we were doing like i figured out like once we have all the data this is how we do it this is how it's going to be amazing and this is how we're going to blow the client's mind but 80 percent of it has to get us there (laughs) do you personify data also oh i personify a lot of things like Chatty and I are friends. I call Chat GPT Chatty. And <laughs> okay. my remarkable in front of me is Remy, and it's my precious. So, <laughs> so yeah, you know, quirky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see. I see where it's going back to. Yeah, I like that. So here, here you've been doing all of these really fun things. Mm-hmm. Um, 
we're going to change it up a little bit. So I, I, I know we were talking offline about writing a book. I'm going to save that one. I'm going to put a pin on that one so we can come back to it. That was a really interesting conversation. What is a favorite quote that you live by? I am still learning by Michelangelo. Is that the quote? Yes. Who says it? Michelangelo. I am still learning. Oh, I see. By Michelangelo. <laughs> it sounds like the name of a book. <laughs> I don't know. Is that, is that it? Yeah. Yeah. No, his quote is, I am still learning. Oh, I that, like that yeah, one. That is my my biggest one. Um, so I even have like a little plaque I got in Italy that says that and it's on my desk. And I even have a tattoo for a Cantonese for to learn. So mm. I always remember um, that is what I do. That is cool. I like that one. Um, the hardest lesson that you learned that changed your life? Not everyone is going to care for my gregariousness and quirkiness. Um, That's very true, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not for everybody, um, but I also have noticed that um, I'm not for those who... Um, I just don't feel comfortable in their own skin yet. You know, they're still growing and learning and they see me and they're like, ah, that's a lot. <laughs> you know what though? Isn't everybody a lot? I think everybody is. Um, I have complete compassion for absolutely everyone. Um, but I can't care what everybody thinks about me because it that's just not how one should go through life. One should be truly authentic to oneself, knowing that, um, you can probably get along with everyone, but who you really care for. Mm -hmm. You know, that's true. I was having this conversation with somebody else and we were talking about, you know, the fact that you, you can like people and there's room to love them, mm -hmm. but sometimes you can love people, but you may not like them yeah. and want to hang out with them. Mm -hmm. Everyone is a divine being and we are all connected. That is very true. But um, some vibrate towards us and some vibrate away from us for a reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not not everybody is meant to like us. I was having to have that conversation with somebody else over at the office too. And they didn't understand that. This It's off. Never mind. I won't even explain it. But it was interesting because they said, I, I think you're too worried about what this person says. And they specifically said they don't want you to contact them. So you need to leave that person alone for however long. Well, their birthday's coming up. I said, nope. They said, leave them alone. Not for you, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's their birthday. It's not the, yeah. not the day you celebrate them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They aren't, they aren't looking for that. So, you know, you need to like leave, leave that alone for sure. Anyway, that some people have a hard time with that too. Yeah, that's for sure. So what are you most grateful for? Mm. I am grateful for the timing that I've been given in this life thus far. I really feel like I have perfect timing. As long as I stay in the flow, I stay patient, mm -hmm. um, then the right things will come for me in the right way. And it's fantastic. And if I'm not patient and I try to rush something, I'm doing something three times. Yeah. And it's just like, why, why did I do this? And so for me, um, I, I do really feel like I have perfect timing when I'm in the flow the mm -hmm. right way. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that patience is, it's one of those words that people, I used to ask God for patience. And then I decided, no, because it comes with trials. And I didn't want to have any more of those trials. So I like the fact that you're saying that when you're in the flow and you can see that patience is, I'm going to paraphrase, a part of that process. Mm -hmm. I think it makes a really big difference as to you're just, there's distractions around you, but you're not paying attention to them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. I like that quite a bit. What would you want to be remembered for? I think. I think the biggest thing is, well, it's, it's twofold. The biggest thing is I, I want to make an impact, um, but I want to make an impact and be known for the generosity in which I was able to give it. Um, I mean, we only have so much time in mm -hmm. this world, but I want the people who I am loyal to or I'm serving or I'm helping, I want them to feel that, um, 
the time that I'm giving them, they understand. It's a gift. It's a, yeah. It, and, and that it was given well. Yeah. Um, no half assery. If yeah. I'm going to do something, I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, and I'm going to do it in the best way that I know how that is healthy with mm-hmm. the right boundaries, obviously. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I, I want, I want to be generous with mm-hmm. it. I want them to at least feel that what I am doing, um, because for me, some of it, if it's my genius, it's easy. I can do it fast, but it's so good that people are like, wow, that was amazing. And I'm like, good. Yes. That's, I, that feels good to me. That feels mm-hmm. like I'm really helping. And it may not have been generous with my time, but it was with then my brain and my genius and my skills and all the things I've picked up along the way that if I can help make that something better, Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be the, that's the best thing for me. Mm. It's good stuff. You used a lot of really positive words that were also having healthy, you use this word too, but boundaries around everything that keeps a person moving forward Mm -hmm. in the flow. Yes. As you said. Yes. But also in a place of um, receiving. Sure. As well as giving. Yeah. Well, that that's taken a lot of personal work and study. (laughs) Yeah, it does. It sure does. Yeah. (laughs) I agree with you. Well, we're going to take a couple minutes to acknowledge our sponsor, Transcend Network, and we will be right back. Transcend Network helps early stage startup founders find product market fit through weekly experiments, receive fundraising support, and build a global founder investor network for edtech and the future of work technologies. The Intern Whisperer is affiliated with Employers for Change and we thank Transcend Network for being a sponsor of our show. Now we're back to the second half of our show where we talk about the future of jobs and industries in 2030. So let's look at what that would look like. What do you think 2030 is going to look like? It's only, you know, we're six and a half years yeah, away from I that. Know. We're going into June. I know. Um, I mean, the first off, we know it's going to be warm. Yeah. And that's going to change a lot of industries and a lot of things. Yeah. Um, but the one thing I'm hoping for, the optimistic hope that I have for with this new advent of artificial intelligence and just being able to write a book report without actually reading it kind of thing um, is that it will change the way we express our knowledge of a topic. And, And in that way, I mean, we'll go back to more having conversations, like even in school settings of presentations and talking about what you learn rather than just pumping out papers. Because now if chatty can pump out all the papers, then, you know, what's the point of that? And so they can use chatty. Um, He's great. But, um, But you have to like know your thesis know what points you want. You need to kind of put the outline Mm -hmm. in there for Mm -hmm. it to be yours, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then that's not enough. It's defend it, talk Mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Because if you can talk about it, if you can present it, even if Chatty does your slides, if you're talking about it, it's in your soul, right? You got it, Mm -hmm. at least for a small short-term memory amount of time. Mm -hmm. So I'm just hoping that that changes the, the dynamic of school which would then change the dynamic of work, right? But don't you think you you mentioned something, preparing a report without having to read the book. Don't you think reading the book is like people crucial. don't <laughs> people don't read that much anymore? Yeah, no, it's crucial. It's crucial, I think, to read and then comp, but read and read and think about it. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, process that's, it. Yeah, well, that's where it is. Is you have to read the book because then you have to come up with what your thesis statement is and what your proof sources are, and then it can write, you know, a little bit here and there. Um, full disclosure on the book review I wrote for my friend Eric Decker's on for his Mackinac Island Nation book. Um, I read it a few years ago and then I ran into him and he was like, Hey, write a review of my book. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. So I went to chatty and I said, Hey, chatty, Mm -hmm. I really, really like this book. I thought it was funny, but I'm not feeling pithy right now. So I want you to focus on the fact that this was cool. This was cool. This was cool. And I really like this. And then it wrote it for me and it added some extra details. I was like, yeah, that's right. That was really good. Yeah. Thanks chatty. 
And I told Eric, this is what I did, but, um, but that's how, you know, it, it was easy and it didn't hurt anything. Mm-hmm. And I can still talk about how much I love the book, but it helped me save instead of writing, you know, for an hour, figuring it out, it took 15 minutes and that was great. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I got to read it. You got to know what you're talking about and um, you got to know your stuff. And I think that's where the change would happen is in order to get grades or in order to then get a job or to work with people is you would need to be able to speak, Mm -hmm. defend ideas, talk about things knowledgeably rather than just pumping out a written report. Mm -hmm. Um, I think just the state of how we'll consume and how we'll discuss information will change. uh, Kind of like cliff notes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's useful. Um, It's a handy reference guide, but you want to be able to talk about it, you know, Mm -hmm. I like it. Okay. So what are your thoughts? I think we're always going to stay in a place of hybrid work because I know companies are saying, no, we want you to come back to the office. And personally, like yourself, I'm an extrovert and I do enjoy being around other people. So I feel like that the extroverts, Mm -hmm. they get that fix that Mm -hmm. they need. The introverts need to be around people because otherwise they become too isolated and siloed. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there's this balance of why we sh- we're met for relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? but, I, but I think it should be done strategically. So I'm hoping uh, that as we evolve with our hybrid learning and, and hybrid working um, is that it'll be much more strategic when you do get together. Mm-hmm. Right. Right now, people go to the office and they sit in their cubicle and they're still on their Zoom because the other people aren't there that day, or they are global and they're working with people in New York and India and California anyway. And so they don't actually like use the conference rooms or go anywhere. I'm speaking from friends that I know Mm -hmm. that this is actually really happening right now. They drive all the way to their office to do exactly what they did in their home office. So I have been reading though um, that the more progressive businesses have realized that it needs to be meaningful, mm-hmm. useful, um, and collaborative for real mm-hmm. and not just use it as that word collaborative as lip service. Like, you know, you go there because that's when you have all your meetings that day to talk about things, to then go home and do the work because you're not going to be able to knock that out when you're in a cubicle. Mm -hmm. you know change the way it works and granted there are some people that are like wow no i really need i need to go somewhere because you know kids dogs my house is a toothpick box you know so you just need to go so then using the office spaces differently building out different environments so someone can also not just live in blah cubicle land but having a cafe inspired space, mm-hmm. a amphitheater inspired space, outdoor working space, this space, that space, like leveraging the areas differently um, and making it more useful for people. So I think, I, th- I hope it'll continue to evolve that way. And that's what I'm seeing in like the different, different trades and different things that I'm reading. Most, yeah, mostly via LinkedIn algorithm telling me what I should read. But that's where I, that's where I'm seeing it. I like messing with those algorithms and saying, "Oh no, I'm not this." You know, I actually am this, <laughs> and so it doesn't feed me stuff. But I still think it feeds me some stuff, and I then I purposely don't click on it. <laughs> you know, just to like mess with it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right. So ethical dilemmas. What do you foresee? in all of this AI that we have here. Oh, goodness. Because you yes. raise, I'm going to go and play dev, devil's advocate mm-hmm. with what you said. Mm-hmm. So people don't read the books. Mm-hmm. They also use chat GPT to mm-hmm. help them write things. Yeah. And then they still have no idea if it was accurate or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and I take it back when we're looking at what chat was is that, well, first we used to have people that would write scribes that would write books. And then we got, I'm fast forwarding, we got people with libraries and we had card catalogs. And then fast forwarding again, we got the internet. Mm -hmm. And so we could Google everything instead of going to a card catalog. Fast forward again, we have chat 
that can um, actually produce things for us where, you know, we, to me, it's collective knowledge in all of Google and every network or every browser that's out there and saying, here, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. So it's faster ways of researching something to produce information. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think it's changed. The process has changed, but not the actual the outcome's faster. I think the outcome is just faster. That's or more that's, accurate. That's probably. exactly it. It's a, it's a touch more accurate, a touch and faster. Um, I've had a lot of interns in my whole existence mm -hmm. and um, to, like feeding an intern, like here's a media kit, write a one pager on this new magazine that's coming out. And then also try to write a recommendation as to um whether we recommend the client buying into the ad, buying an ad space in this magazine or not, or this TV show or this, you know, whatever. Um, and then I'd send them off. Two days later, I get something back mm -hmm. and it's rough, you yeah. know? Whereas now I could just go to chatty mm -hmm. <laughs> and say, Hey, <laughs> here's the information, right? a brief overview, less than 300 words yeah. that covers the most important topics that are the themes of this thing. And then it does. And then I read it and go, well, I'm going to want to say I recommend or don't recommend because blah, 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 but make it sound more professional and smarter. And then it does. <laughs> and that was 15 minutes. It was less than 15. Minutes. Yeah. And then I've got the rough spot. So I'm not saying don't hire interns. I'm saying teach your interns to do that too. So they're faster. So you can give them more better things that are cooler to do while still doing intern work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So right now I don't have an intern. Chatty is my intern. <laughs> yeah. I see that. Yeah. And they work, they work unpaid. They do. It's yeah. fantastic. Well, unless then, you know, you, you don't have to feed them. No current. Yeah. <laughs> currently, you know, not paid currently, you know, we're helping them improve. So, you know, when something is free, you're the product. Yeah. You're the <laughs> guinea pig. <laughs> you're the guinea pig. But for now, um, yeah, it's, it's great. Like I, I've gotten really systematic of like Jack and I, we record our conversations or we record a client meeting. Um, I'll take, the recording throw it into otter get the transcripts and then i will um take the transcripts and hoping that they're not super long if they are i'll chunk it up into pieces but then i'll throw it into chatty and say summarize and i get great notes something easy to yeah. reference you upload the the transcript is that what you do mm -hmm. i just yeah. copy and paste i'm not we're not doing anything fancy with chatty yet with mm -hmm. all the back end stuff i'm just gotcha. using, using the straight interface yeah. yeah. So what's the ethical dilemma out of that? Um, I think the ethical dilemma is um, putting a stamp on something that's, if it's not yours, you know, like um, I'll take notes from what I've done or the conversations I've had and have it write a blog post for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't find that as an ethical violation because it's mine. Yeah, I wouldn't either. No. But if you're going to be like writing one and it's like a, almost a report, but you're not citing anyone. And yeah, you're not you, have doing anything, so you have to do citations. You have to do citations. And so this was the funny thing is I was doing, I was writing a blog and I, I, I said, you know, and find me a couple of sources on this, but cite them. And then. Did you tell them what method to cite? APA, MLA? I let Chatty just guess. Okay. I just wanted to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of things that they found because of the fact that they, they um, now using the plural pronoun for chatty, you know, they go back and forth. Um, but the uh, chatty um, came back with old references that the links aren't valid anymore because mm. it doesn't have the latest website information. You didn't cases. give it like a time parameter, like can't be more than a year old. Well, when it's more than a, like it only has reference points with some data up to like mm -hmm. what, 2017, 18, something really? like that. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that's one of the, like the disclaimers currently. It's like, we don't have some of the latest stuff. Um, if you ask it, like I've asked it to um, go to my 
you know, website, Patty is still learning.com and write in that voice with this information. And it seems to be able to, cause it's like, wow, that does sound like me. That's great. Yeah. Um, when you write, you know, 13 years of content, you, you start to sound pretty specific. So it's yeah. picked up on it. Well, um, and I guess maybe predictable because yeah. there's keywords that are being used. Oh yeah. 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 So the same same vibe it gets, um, which is pretty cool. And I do the same thing with Groundwood Data. I'm like, right in the same vibe um, of what we've done because mm -hmm. we're playful and quirky and nerdy and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of fun things to do. But you, but if you're, you but always source your stuff, always source it. There, there's so many times I see even um, people do PowerPoints and then they state, they, they like put a fact in. And I'm like, where, where did this fact even come from? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, a little academic but for every deck we put together even if i'm like presenting to a group of kids about something or other and there's a stat i've got uh, i've got um ala or mla sources like at the yeah. bottom <laughs> like sometimes there's five deep and i have footnotes um but sometimes like it's fun i'll have like even a little gwd because i was like that's us <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, but ethics in terms of that is like citing your sources, checking. Um, I'm not quite sure how 100% accurate, like Grammarly right now, I've taken something I've written, even when I'm just be like, I would like to do a, a, you know, a basic piece on this, but I've got to start somewhere, write an overview of this information. And I've thrown it into um, Grammarly to check the, oh, what's it called? What's it called? plagiarism there we go oh, okay. plagiarism button um and th th it's pretty off like it's pretty not it, like it's coming up like three percent is plagiarized and it's random phrases and stuff so um always checking for that making sure that it's like your own mm -hmm. as well and it's if you know even if it's chatty writing it it's like not using other people's stuff um i think it's the ethics in that it's like don't scrape something and call it your own um and cite and source everything mm -hmm. and then the ethical consideration of is it your um if it's your opinion then figure out how you back it up mm -hmm. <laughs> your yeah. way um yeah and then when it comes that's because ethics and business i mean in business we're taught to just grab stuff all the time you know mm -hmm. for stuff you know yeah you know it's not it's not academia <laughs> yeah so in in business ethics it's more or less you've just got to know your stuff don't um, don't, if you're, a, if you're a PR writer, don't, you know, just have chatty, you know, write a, a press release on a topic because you, you work with like a plumbing company and then it just writes all this stuff and you don't check it and you just throw it on there yeah. and half of it's plagiarized and yeah. half of it doesn't make any sense for the plumbing community. Like you, you've got to still know your stuff, you know, you've yeah. got to be a professional. Um, even if yeah. you're an entry level student, right? Yeah. Yeah. So one of my friends, um, he doesn't listen to my show, so I'm not too worried. <laughs> <laughs> um, he asked me to review, he has prepared three business plans and he did it with no deposit, no nothing down. And he used chat GPT to, to produce them. Mm. And they did not look, none of them were consistent. So he didn't ask for a consistent table of contents. He didn't ask, but I could tell it was very generic mm. there. It definitely is very, very generic. We're going to sell things to people and it's going to cost money. Yeah. <laughs> and I asked him, yeah, thumbs up for sure. <laughs> and I said, that I had a list of, it was about 37 things from reading just one plan. I said, did you interview this person? Because this doesn't seem very personal and there is nothing mentioned of anybody in here that is a human. It is just a CEO does this, a COO does this. And I said, like, that is, how can you even do financials on a plan that you haven't interviewed somebody on? And you don't have any clear direction as to what you're doing. And you're saying that the company is going to open in 2024. I mean, there was just like all of these for me, red flags, because I went, no, yes, you know, I'll use your name, Chatty, mm -hmm. was able to do that. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's right. And no. he, he said, yeah, I only spent five minutes on it. And I said, it shows. <laughs> yeah. You can write a lot of gobbledygook in five minutes. <laughs> well, Chatty did it for him, yeah. but it was like, 
There was no personalization. There was no customization to it. And I feel like that's where. Well, he was doing it for free. You no, he was <laughs> he was submitting it to the person to be able to look at, to decide if they wanted him to move forward. And I said, first off, I would never do that. I would have said, here, you pay me a retainer or, you know, yeah. a deposit mm -hmm. to get started. And then, yes, I'll produce it, but I'm going to make it so it's customized to you. Why would I want a generic thing when I could have done that myself? Yeah. Yeah. You no, know? That's, that's quite silly. The, the, the genius is how you craft yeah. what that is. You're, so going back to the 20, yeah. the 2030 idea of the change, um, I'm hoping as well. These are all hopes. Um, but I'm feeling pretty good about it is that we're going to move from this kind of transactional linear. Um, I will do this for this amount and this and like stages of things mm -hmm. um, in a very linear way, more towards the value and the genius. Mm -hmm. Like I want, I like these two words value and the genius. Yeah. And, um, and so you get, paid for access to i'm hoping because this is what i want to sell myself as is you sell your access to your brain and your genius yeah right and so there is work involved in that but it's not there's the value base isn't on um either the time you put mm -hmm. into it or the the quantity it's the, mm -hmm. it's the it's the overall value it's yeah. the genius um and so now actually like we, the way we charge is, you know, like, is this a, it's either by the hour, yeah. I do a flat rate and I know yeah. what it is and yeah. I know how fast I can get it done. Yeah. But, but I don't want to get penalized for figuring out a way to do it faster. Neither do I. Yeah. And yeah. so we do flat rate it, but we focus on like, is it genius or is it excellence or is it like something? Can it be both? Well, it can be both, but we, you know, we're like, um, I say, so we can do genius or we do like it's competence. Like we can mm -hmm. do this with our eyes closed. You know, we're still going to not charge the cheapest for something we can do with our eyes closed because yeah. it'll take other people longer. But the genius, that's where that's that's really what the, the value is. And that's to be clear, I invoiced him. Yes, I like, did. I sent the invoice and I said, so I'm looking for this uh -huh. like now. Mm -hmm. Turn it to me within 24 hours and. Good luck to you on doing it your way. Yeah. <laughs> because I was pointing out all of these things. He's been through some accelerator programs and he knows what he was supposed to be putting he in there. He was taking the lazy way out. He sure was. And now he paid for it. Well, I'm going to hope he pays me first. Yeah. <laughs> it's been almost 24 hours. So I'm going to go, Where? where's your Where's your payment? Yeah. Send it in. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think the the future is going to be like? Do you, do you see robots? Do you see AR? Do you see holograms? Do you see Star Trek, you know, where oh, we're in big, particles? Yeah, the particles. Um, or something else, yeah, avatars. No, I, I think, yeah, the avatars are coming. Maybe yeah, but I just sit here and I go, I don't want to be in a coffin where I'm just laying and oh, my I avatar's know. running all over the place. But I that was know. not being human. No, well, it, um, if 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 Zuck, Zuckerberg has his way with uh, Meta, he is. I've, I've chatted with somebody at the jazz festival in um, in May. He worked for Meta. 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 So he worked for Meta. Um, but he was he's focused on the Oculus and the goggles mm -hmm. and the turning the AR experience, uh, turning everything into a uh, VR, not a just VR. AR, but VR. But turning like starting Ready Player One. Yeah, you know, like they really want that to happen but it's not it's not going to happen as fast as he wants so i don't think we're going to get to 2030 with that um just from talking to that guy who's doing it he's like yeah no we're never close <laughs> okay all right that's fine um it'll ramp up though um but what i like very much um and i hope that it continues down is they figure out a better way to do google glass no, oh, that's out there though too. They're oh, working I know. on that. Oh, I know. Yeah, but the the better way of making it lighter, making it um, though that so that people know. Like I've got a friend who's got, he's got a pair of sunglasses that if he presses a little button, it gets posted onto Facebook. I was like, I do not like that at all. You know, like that is not cool. Sounds um, like it's straight from um, Black Mirror. Yeah, it exists. 
they're in Ray-Ban style sunglasses. Mm -hmm. Um, But what I really, what I really like, and I think would be incredibly beneficial would, even if it's not in your glasses, just your phone. And that's happening now. I mean, with Yelp, with the Google translator, with all the things that augment the world with more useful information um, that makes things um, deeper, you know, and more meaningful. Um, So while walking around with glasses downtown and all these, you know, businesses are starting to like throw ads at you and be like, we're five star Michelin rated. Oh my God, it's crazy. But if, you know, you could selectively be like, I would like to narrow this down and find this or find that, or um, be able to leverage that kind of information more. um, I think that would be very useful. Oh, it says here, Google, Google glass will no longer be sold. I know. Yeah. They got to get it together. It wasn't, it wasn't useful. It was heavy, bulky, weird. I saw people with it and I'd be like, Oh, that that's too nerdy for me. I can't do that. <laughs> there, um, there comes a place when it is it's too nerdy. The line has to be drawn. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Way too much. Way too much. Yeah. Um, but uh, I see the potential for it. There is um, a book I read a long time ago. It was like a short vignette of stories. And there mm-hmm. was this one story of how they were able to leverage using the glasses and the headsets to almost kind of put a little polish on the world that's kind of old and tired. Mm-hmm. Um, better signage, better front scapes, you know, better just looking through things but um it was a fascinating idea and that's always kind of stuck with me of like how do you leverage it for good and not um not the way they did it because you know there's always always goes sideways it does sound like black mirror you're talking about i know it's a it's i'll 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 find the book i'll share it with you yeah it's a really cool short story stuff it's all about the future um but yeah, I like that. I also in the Apple TV's um, their show extrapolations, they use it's not glasses. It's this weird little thing they put on their temple. So that that also I don't care for attaching something. They to did my that body. at Black Mirror too. Yeah, and it's, just, it's all culminating into reality. If enough yeah, people think of it. Um, but yeah, it, using data in the real world to help make better decisions when it's at your fingertips more is always what I'm about. I like more input. I like, um, I like to use it as a way to filter and my choices. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I hope to see more of that. I, I agree with what you're saying so much. I find it that um, I appreciated the pause that everybody did on chat for a a period of time because they realized, well, gosh, there's like things we haven't thought about and Mm -hmm. we should be making sure we're, we're being ethical in our launch of this Mm -hmm. and how, um, people can take it and go South really fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate that a lot. Well, (laughs) it's a reoccurring construct in our society. There are always going to be the early adopters or the individual quirky weirdos who will do try to be in the bad way no 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 that's all good they start good it all is um, you know for the betterment of themselves and then it slowly gets to the betterment of humanity but it's all about them living their own personal truth Mm -hmm. and it just so happens to um get picked up by people with a more tribal mindset yeah and i think it's the people with the tribal mindset who are like oh i want to take this you know for me and my people but not your people and that's where it gets broken out but then you get the mindset of well then how do we regulate it to make everyone safe and there mm-hmm. so there are three different kinds of people in the world and uh, you know it can go south on any of them but i think in the tribal category of oh i want this for me and not for you know or for my people and not for your people um that's where it can go south so mm-hmm. once once the once enough people get on the bandwagon is when as a tribe it gets a little nutty so, yeah so then you need the people to go stop think wait how do we regulate this just to make it safe for everybody because yeah. we know that it's gonna get crazy so mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. but it starts with the wacky individuals <laughs> yeah yeah it absolutely will 
So what is, it's hard to believe we're at the end of this area, but what is the best mentoring advice that you would share with our listeners? And to be clear, our listeners are anywhere from, you know, 22, 23 to about 65. We're split with a little bit more men than women in all industries. Oh, goodness. So am I offering advice as a mentor to them or am I offering advice um as if they are mentors to others. You are offering advice as you are a mentor to them. Okay. Um, always keep an open mind. Always. Like, don't let your lizard brain go, but that's the way I, oh, oh no, sh- 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 lizard brain. Mm-hmm. Quiet for a moment. The young people will teach you new things. Mm-hmm. And the older people have some experience mm-hmm. that you should listen to as well. Yeah, Everyone has a perspective. And the interesting thing is that people who have been doing things for a long time, they might know the fastest way the water will flow. But the young people coming up will have either a new technology or a technique that the older people never even thought of. So you have to keep an open mind and listen to absolutely everyone. And then take what you will with it. But don't think you know everything all the time because you are not as old as the oldest and you're not young enough with the young. You are, you're just, you're there to witness and observe and absorb. So I was listening to you and I go and Google, what does the Lion King have to say? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, and I'm not going to do the beginning part, but so we are all connected in the great circle of life. <laughs> so I'm going to go with that. Oh, I'm such an elder millennial. Yes, I probably yeah. know the Lion King word for word and have incorporated it into my soul. Well, let me give yeah. it to you then. When we die, our bodies become the grass yes. and the antelope eat, eat the, grass. the grass. And so we are mm-hmm. all connected in the great circle of life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We- forget that first part. It, the point is, is that we can learn from every generation ahead of us mm-hmm. and every generation behind us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you don't, <laughs> the reason why some of those that are older, they don't have anybody talking to them. So go talk to them yes. and just like, listen to the stories because at some point in time, it's going to be you doing probably the same thing. Mm-hmm. And it's going, Hey, Chet, tell me what I'm supposed to say today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Exactly. Oh my gosh. So funny. How can people get a hold of you? We typically give your LinkedIn profile and then we also have your website up here. But how else? Where do you want people to follow you? I know you mentioned that, you know, you have a YouTube channel. Yeah, subscribe to my YouTube channel, please. Yeah. That would be awesome. Um, Jack and I uh, put things up there either as a series. We've got a series on business, on data science, on um, operations. Um, But then we also throw up our quirkiness in the shorts, of course. Um, And then Jack's dabbling even more into music these days. So as they finally produce some things, we'll throw that up there too. Oh, we get to listen to him play? Uh uh Oh, that sounds like a good thing. Yeah, we've got a great one um, in honor of his brother who passed away last Uh year. Um, But it's um, a fantastic classical rendition but to on an electric guitar so um, you just got to go check it out it's amazing um but that's our youtube we have instagram um and the linkedin and the facebook Facebook. yeah we have the facebook and we have our website and on our website you can sign up for our newsletter Mm -hmm. um we also publish a lot of our research um so when clients ask us to do best practices on generational differences or different research projects we do because it's all third party data we just take it and re-spin it and put it in as a research paper so that everybody can access it yeah Um, digest it exactly think about it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we like to share we we want to provide value to everyone Well, this has been a really interesting conversation. I know we didn't get to cover some of the other stuff we were talking about before the show started, (laughs) but I'm going to continue that conversation offline with you. Of course. Yeah. Happy to do so. Thank you for being such a great guest. Oh, my pleasure. It was wonderful being on here. I thank everyone for uh, listening in and staying on. Yeah. And watching. So closed caption, we have our show set up for the deaf and the international. So the closed captions are on there and they're accurate. We use other services to also, you know, subscriber thing like this. And our downloads are the biggest thing. So we're, our goal is to hit 20,000 by the end of this year. So noble goal. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I want to thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Yes, of course. Great to be here. Thank you to our sponsor, Cat5 Studios, and thank you to our production team, producer and editor, Leona Blair, and music is by Sophie Lloyd. Visit Employers for Change at www.e4c.tech to learn how you can create real diversity and inclusion culture while skilling your people for the future of work. Thank you for supporting the Intern Whisperer podcast by subscribing to us on Podbean, our Employers for Change YouTube channel, or stream from your favorite podcast channel.